Please be seated. It's great to be back with you all. Tom, thank you for letting me come back. Tomorrow is Martin Luther King Day, and I'm not going to preach about that. You know, in the church, we celebrate Martin Luther King Day on the day he was assassinated, like all the martyrs. And in secular society, we celebrate when he's born, because I think it's too painful to realize, except within the church, that that's what it takes. We only, we only move on by dying to ourselves. Um, and so I am reminded of something that he said once that just grabbed me, and I want to share it with you just to sort of tag this weekend in honor of him. <clears throat> he was wrestling with the dichotomy between power and love. You and I tend to think that if you're loving, then you're not powerful, and if you're powerful, then you're not loving. That power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Listen to what Dr. King had to say about power and love because it is absolutely what drove his life. Listen to this. Power without love is abusive and domineering. And love without power is sentimental and anemic. Isn't that lovely? Love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power without love is abusive and domineering. Power at its best is implementing the demands of justice. And justice at its best is correcting everything that stands against love. So, I wish I'd said that. (laughs) So, Martin Luther King Jr. Remember, it's the the season of Epiphany. And what does Epiphany mean? I got to tell you all, the 11 o'clock crowd got it last last, uh, time. What does Epiphany mean? Revelation, appearing. It's really about light. It's really about light. And we started off singing the opening hymn. Thou reignest in glory, thou rulest in light. Thine angels adore thee, all veiling their sight. All laud we will render. Oh, help us to see, tis only the splendor of light hideth thee. It's only the splendor of the light that makes God invisible. Like you can't see, the, you know, like the sun. You can't look at that light. I love it. Epiphany is all about light. And it starts with that star in Bethlehem, remember? And the wise men coming to Bethlehem. And then last Sunday, you read about the baptism of Jesus and the voice that says, you are my beloved son and you I am well pleased. It's a big light moment. And now we have this moment when Jesus does his first miracle in Cana of Galilee. The Gospel of John reads on many, many levels. There's always the story level, sort of the the superficial, here's here's what's happening. And you can take it at that level and, and should take it at that level. But then the fun part is to dig deeper and say, what's John also saying in addition to just the story level? So I want to take a look at that for a moment. He and his disciples are invited to this wedding in Cana. His mother is also invited there. Jewish weddings in that day lasted seven days. Can you imagine? We only had one daughter and only one night that we had to take care of. I can't imagine seven days. But you're in charge of seven days of providing for all the guests. And, and who are the guests? Well, it's your entire village. So they've run out of wine, which is a huge embarrassment. And Jesus' mother comes and says, Jesus, they've run out of wine. (laughs) And did you notice this, this back and forth between Mary and Jesus? He says, woman, what has that to do with you or me? Like, it's not my problem. Um, (laughs) And like a good Jewish mom, she knows he's going to do what what she says. (laughs) She doesn't even fight with him. She just knows because the next words out of her mouth is she looks over to the servants and says, do whatever my boy says. 
I mean, it's just lovely. <laughs> it's just really lovely how that little play and the humor is, is right there in the gospel. And so, Jesus looks at these six big stones, 30, 20 to 30 gallons each. Six times 20 and 30, 120 to 180 gallons. And he tells the servants to go fill them up with water. Well, do you know what they have to do to fill them up with water? They have to go to the well. They have to drop down little wineskins. They didn't have buckets. They're dropping down little wineskins, walking it back over to these stone and filling 180 gallons. It's not just an easy task. It probably took half a day at least. So they fill it all up. And as soon as they finish filling it up, Jesus says, okay, take a ladle and take some to the wine steward, the guy who's in charge, the MC of the party, and let him taste it. We don't know when that water turns into wine. It doesn't tell us. But by the time it gets into the mouth of the wine steward, he says, wow, this is the best wine. Most people, like you and me, serve the good stuff up front and then the bad stuff later on after the taste buds, right? Been, yeah, you understand, I understand. But the best stuff is saved, the new stuff is better. Hold on to that. And so all is saved, all is saved. Jesus restores the party. That's the story level. And it works at that level. But one wonder if there's a different level. You remember that John's gospel starts this way. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God. And the Word was with God. Through Him all things were made. So through the, in, the pre-existent Word of God all things were made. And then John ends by saying the, the light came into the darkness and those who were here could not see the light, but those who believed in him became children of God. Remember that part? So, in the beginning, in John's gospel, is an absolute repetition of Genesis. In the beginning, God said, blah, blah, blah. In the beginning, God. John's gospel is saying, this is a new creation. In the beginning, was the word. So we're already beginning to get John's play of what he wants to say in his gospel. The old has passed and the new has come. A new creation. So if these jars of water were there for rites of purification, rites of purification, much like baptismal water. Um, 180 gallons? Do you know how much water we use for baptisms? It's just a drop. It's a symbolic amount. 180 gallons is enough to baptize the whole world into this new life. See? So, again, if, if the jars symbolize the old Judaism rites of purification. What John wants to say, 90 AD, is something bigger and better has come than the old. Grace and truth have come through Jesus Christ. The law and the prophets came through Moses. Remember that? So there's already this tension going on. And the disciples believed. The disciples believed. <laughs> There's also a wonderful play going on. The wine steward did not know where that wine had come from. That was his job. He's supposed to know. But the servants knew where the wine had come from. Guess what? The chief priest and the Pharisees didn't know who Jesus really was. But the people in, in Galilee knew who he was. See how John is playing on all this? It's really beautiful. The old has passed. The new has come. And in him is fullness of life, is what John is saying. And this new wine is so much better 
than the old. I think that's the story, but I want to leave you with the thought. It's a different twist on this. <clears throat> I can't turn water into wine, but I spend a lot of time turning the wine that is my life into ordinary water. And you probably do that too. We take the graciousness, the beauty, the love that is showered upon us, and instead of seeing delicious wine, I see water. Ordinary. My wife wakes up and says, good morning, darling. And I say, what's good about it? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you've done that. We take all those blessings that God so richly, abundantly, 180 gallons pours upon us, and we just expect it and treat it as it's ordinary. <sighs> Don't turn your wine into water. That's what I think this is about. Don't turn the life that God has given you, which is a beautiful bouquet of fragrance and color and texture. Don't turn it back into water. So think with me this week, and when you see yourself taking a moment when wine is being given to you and turning it into water, catch yourself. Catch yourself and say, oh my gosh, that's what I'm doing. I'm taking wine and I'm making water. I want to be like Jesus. I don't want to take water and make wine. Amen.